also hope that we can um, in the future really do it again in person, but for now I'm happy to be able to present um, some of the research on transatlantic relations and maybe say a few words about my newest book, um, the European Union's International Promotion of LGBTI Rights. Um, and you also, I think, asked me to say a little bit about sort of, you know, how it is as a European to embark on an academic career in Europe, right? So it, maybe I should start at that. Um, and I think, yeah, like I got 45, 50 minutes, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Thank you. Fantastic. Good. And then we can, I can, hope I can get some good questions from you or any comments. Um, the, um, well, I started in my first connection with the US was actually after I did my, um, my bachelor, my diploma in Germany. And um, because I, I was born in Germany near Munich, in Bavaria. And um, so I was then wondering what to do yet. I studied sort of social work, social sciences, and um, there was a Fulbright organization offered some stipends. And so in 1997, 1998, I received a Fulbright grant, um, which is a great organization in case you wanna go spend some time in the US to uh, pursue a research project or study there. It's a really a wonderful transatlantic organization. And so I did my masters in the US, came back to Munich, um, worked there at the University of Munich in the international office for the emerging, you know, that was the Bologna process. And it was 97, 98. And I worked for there as an Erasmus office administrator, but um, wanted to go further. Um, I still had some mental curiosity left and um, another private, a couple private issues also. Anyway, um, I ended up returning back to the United States. And so I wanted to be on the East Coast. I was looking for universities on the East Coast, all the way from New York, NYU, down to Miami. But Miami had already the, uh, in early 2000s, the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Miami. Um, so Florida International University, which I am, is the public research university. The University of Miami, also in Miami, is the private um, university. So at that time, um, I went to the Jean Monnet Center um, of Excellence at the University of Miami and studied under a Spanish or Catalan prof, did my doctorate in um, international relations with an emphasis on European studies. Um, and then, you know, um, I, I know from hearsay, from experience, from anecdotes, how difficult it is to get a long-term professorial chair, a professorial position in Europe. So I was, after I graduated in 2005, looking for positions in the United States. And you may be familiar with the so-called tenure track system, right? And that tenure track system is fairly attractive for academics. That's here in the US. Increasingly, seemingly introduced in across European states as well. But anyway, um, first I spent three years as a visiting lecturer here at Florida International University because their Europeanist left to Europe, to Geneva to be specific, to a graduate institute. And um, then after that, I, a tenure track position, her tenure track position opened up. And so I had to reapply had to compete with Europeans for the Europeanist position, and then I became a um, tenure track professor. What that means in practice, just very quickly, is that um, in Europe, you have six years after you get your doctorate, six years to get what's called tenure, and tenure is um, the commitment of the university that you're good enough that they will keep you for basically the rest of your life. Um, after six years, I, I, I got tenure, I received tenure, and then I was what, I'm, what I am now, associate professor, not anymore assistant professor. And um, now um, I'm right now going through the process of becoming a full professor. So after another six years, you can start applying for full professor. And um, it, I'm not going to say anything. It looks good, but I'm not going to. Thank you. Yes, yes, I appreciate it. Um, but anyway, that would be then the final step, the full professor. Um, similar to a, not quite as illustrious as a chair, professorial chair, but um, it's basically our final promotion. So it, that I'm just telling you this in case some of you are actually looking um, to go on. I think most of you are in the master's program, right? Um, we also do have good um, PhD programs here and FIU is a relatively cheap university, state university. And we are um, also in the top 100 of public universities 
Um, we are also an APSIA school recently. So APSIA is the Association for Professional School of International Affairs. Um, there are only 40 schools around the world. And so we are also in that elite club. I'm just showing, telling you all this to show you that um, we are a interesting place to study. And Miami itself, as Professor Finizio knows from his visits, is also a quite interesting international global space. Now, that's just about me. Now, a little bit before we really talk about the topic transatlantic relations, about the newest research of mine, exactly the international relations, um, the European Union's international LGBT rights promotion. Uh, that came out because it was, a, in a way, a labor of love of two of my in research topics. Um, my first one is the political sociology of Europe. So how do European societies relate to EU institutions? Then the second is sort of identity politics and LGBT politics, sexuality and gender. And then the third is sort of public diplomacy, transatlantic relations and so on. And here I was able with a new book to combine um, in the, my, my first two things. So what I'm the main point of the book, just very quickly, is that I'm taking a critical look. And if you read my article, you know that I'm more of a sort of critical theory scholar, critical of a critical persuasion. I take a critical look at the European Union's generally positive, but fairly liberal, maybe even neoliberal promotion of LGBTI rights around the world. So I'm saying the EU's relatively forceful promotion of LGBT rights across the world has not only made things maybe better in specific countries, but also has elicited a significant pushback, uh, resistance from other countries, and it maintains sort of the geopolitical inequalities that exist between the EU as a global power and global south countries, right? when the EU basically threatens Global South countries to withhold development aid should they not adhere to the EU's LGBTI rights standards. And I do so in a couple of case studies in the book. I'm looking at um, the accession negotiations of particular Balkan countries. Contrast that with the European neighborhood policy. And basically the point is in both cases, you know, there's a lot of superficial adaptation going on without deeper internalization of LGBTI rights. And then I'm looking also at development policy because the EU collectively is the world's largest development actor. And the final substantive chapter is um, I'm, I'm examining the EU's activity in the UN Human Rights Council. So um, if you're interested, I'll be happy to answer any questions later in the Q&A period. But for now, let me get to the topic. And for that, I want to show you a couple of slides to help us guide through what I'm saying. And um, I hope you all can hear me and understand me. I'm trying to speak a little bit slower so that there's no problem. OK. I'm sharing the screen, so it will take a minute, a few seconds. So I hope you can see it now. And here, OK, good. So as you can see here, this is the title for today, the US's view of the EU, transatlantic politics of optics or substance. So basically my question that I examine in the new uh, work um, for Professor Finitio's book, edited volume, <clears throat> is the question, are given the increasingly volatile transatlantic relations that we've seen over the past basically 20 years, I would say, uh, do we still have that substantial substance of, you know, being together the West? Or is it increasingly, are we increasingly becoming more interdependent, independent as Europeans? And, and is it more politics of optics, right? Where both try to, to still remain together, even though they have really diverging goals. Oh, and uh, um, since I like to use um, political cartoons a lot. Can you see this here, the map of you? Good. <clears throat> I um, just put you up here, um, a cartoon that was taken from Politico EU about the Trump's vision of Europe, Trump's version of Europe, right? And you can see here how just take, oh, can you make the slide bigger? Honestly, this is the presentation mode. I cannot make it. <clears throat> I cannot make it bigger. I don't know if locally that can be done. 
Yeah, it doesn't. Did you work? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So if you, thank you. So um, here you can see. Yeah, everything okay? Yeah. So so here you can see the um, alleged Trump vision of the various European countries, right? I mean, um, interesting if you look at Italy, right? It's the perfect democracy. I'm not sure if that refers back to Berlusconi or even to Mussolini, right? And that is for Trump, you never know, at least according to his, his, the Germans are just dodgy car dealers, right? Um, you can see here Slovenia and surrounding are the potential Czech Republic, the potential wives, right? Poland is considered the fortress Europe, big parades in France, and the original bad hombres or bad people in Spain and Portugal, Iberia. So, uh, whereas um, I don't want to even say what this, what Sweden and the Scandinavian countries are called up there, right? So this is a fairly simplified, and I think you all are familiar with this whole spat. There have been lots of memes. There has been lots of actual diplomatic gaps about America first versus Europe united, right? As a as a counterpoint to that divide and conquer tactic that the Trump administration, but also previous Republican administrations think about. Um, I'm thinking here about the uh, George W. Bush administration during the Iraq war. You may remember Donald Rumsfeld notion uh, where he separated old and new Europe and so on and so on. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you only cartoon, but just to kind of as an opener. Um, so part of the issue is here that there's what I'm claim in the article and in my work on transatlantic relation is that there has been not only a misunderstandings and that's sort of characterized here in the first slide where President Obama at the time um, arrives in Britain. This is David Cameron, right? The state visit and says, I'm happy to be in Europe. And of course, that person that's representing UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, but generally, obviously European, a lot of the British population, given that Brexit occurred, says you're not in Europe, right? So there has been a, oftentimes a misunderstanding. Um, it's hard enough for European citizens to understand the European Union, so imagine American citizens or even also American policy leads to understand that. But the main point that I want to drive home in a way is for today and that you want to think about is the, the cartoon on the right, right, which shows you very clearly there is a that transatlantic rift, the transatlantic distance has obviously become longer, right? So there is still a sort of a transatlantic bridge there, largely buttressed by trade, but it certainly has become a wider Atlantic overall. And even, I mean, we all are familiar of the Trump administration, right? That was sort of the, probably the low point of transatlantic relations over the last hundred years, right? I mean, um, you know, the uh, uh, refusal of the Iran nuclear deal that the Europeans really put lots of effort in. Um, the denial of climate change, right? Um, the downgrading of the EU's delegation in Washington, D.C. was a diplomatic affront. Um, but aside from these temporary disputes, and we've seen now, of course, that there is more willingness to work together under Biden administration, there are really long term differences in the transatlantic relationship, such as, you know, different attitudes on um, organic trade and genetically modified organisms, for example. Differences among capital punishment being, you know, um, the ability to put down criminals to death, which is still very much used in the United States, but is um, where the European Union basically outlawed and, and fights against it. The role of NATO is, of course, the 900 next to Russia and China, the 900 pound gorilla in the security cooperation between the US and the European Union. And of course, slightly less critical, but also difficult are the continued trade relations, because as you know, the trade relations are so competitive. We basically are neck to neck with the United States. I'll say a few numbers later on. And that, of course, means that we're also the largest bilateral trading partners, but uh, we're becoming potentially uh, competitors in the future as well. So. Um, Aside from these policy differences that are sometimes more temporary, sometimes more enduring, as I just tried to point out, 
Um, there's also, of course, now the personalities that play a role. And here we can see that after the Trump administration, I'm sure most of you would agree that European leaders in general are not a not a somewhat fed up by having to change their perspective every four years, depending on which US administration is in power, right? Usually uh, Europeans align more with democratic administrations in Washington, and they have to work harder to find some congruence with uh, Republican administrations. But the Trump administration was really sort of the nail in the coffin um, of the stability. European leaders, I mean, if even Angela Merkel says, right, that um, the US is not a reliable partner anymore, then that should give you pause for thought. Um, and so I thought it was telling that the Politico, if you read Politico EU, which is a great source for European Union uh, news coverage, right, I just have to read it to you. It's a really good quote that an uh, analytic observer said after the Trump administration, when the Biden administration came in, he uh, said, well, the hostile and nasty American arrogance of Donald Trump is gone and it's replaced by the more polite and friendly American arrogance that the Europeans remember, right? So you, what that means is sort of like we're returning under the Biden administration, maybe to, or the Biden administration wants to return possibly to this sort of you slightly unilateral, and we've seen this, for example, with the Afghan uh, evacuation, right? Slightly unilateral policy approach that is pretty much still file friendly, still unilateral, and still fairly arrogant. And to me, it harks back to sort of uh, the US's Cold War mentality about them having to protect the European Union and Europe, right? But also being a dominant protector. And Europeans, as you know, want to fundamentally change that relationship to a relationship of equals. And so I think the next four to eight years will be quite interesting to watch that. So what some of the questions that I want to hopefully answer or that um, you should consider um, for yourself is, of course, how can we both work together, both sides, to solve multilateral issues, given that not necessarily for me because we represent the West, because I think that's a problematic concept in itself, but because we, in part because it, we are liberal um, powers, but we're also quite powerful um, blocks, the US as well as the European Union. Um, and here, it used to be Syria. Now we have to, again, Afghanistan is back on the front burner, right? But also, of course, terrorism doesn't go away. You know, Middle Eastern conflicts do not go away or North African. And more importantly, or increasingly, how can we solve the global issue of climate change? We shall see what happens. What is the next week at the COP26 in Glasgow? Another question that I pose in the um, in the my written published piece is: to what degree is the EU? recognized by the US as a significant, but also autonomous, right? So both are important terms as a significant actor in its own right, but also a autonomous actor um, because in the past, US administrations, no matter if it's Republican or Democrat, have basically their main diplomacy was not channeled through Brussels, but it was channeled through the national capitals, the 27. Another question is, I mean, we have to reflect on that, right? How have American perceptions of the EU and vice versa, of course, but I was asked to talk about the EU's perspective from the US here. How have these American perceptions of the EU changed with the different leaders and has the Atlantic uh, drift got wider under the Trump presidency? And the short answer that I kind of gave you already is, I do think it has become wider because there's a, a irreparable um, signaling of um, unreliability. No. Uh, the question that I ask in my um, article for the critical handbook of critical European studies is are enduring differences in leadership and socioeconomic models, sort of comparing US neoliberal uh, market models with the European more so European social model to the extent that it still exists. And of course, also the divergence over the acceptance of the building up of the European Union and a more multipolar system. 
right? You all, I think, have take IR, have you know about multipolarity, right? But so basically, you know, we had this Cold War bipolarity, and then there was a short moment in the 90s, which is often seen with the end of history, Fukuyama's end of history, as so like the unipolar moment of the US. And now we're moving significantly to a generally with BRICS, with the emergence of the global south, to a multipolar system. The big question is, has the Biden administration registered? To what extent have they registered? You can all hear me, right? Just quick check. Good. Now, the official stance here that I want to give you, um, and I title, subtitle this already as a unique TAR stands for transatlantic relations, right? So the unique transatlantic relations are in many ways unique, not only because, and I tell you here, it's somewhat artificial during the Cold War. It was, by the way, also already, basically, it was not only during the Cold War, it started much earlier. Um, during the 20s, after the First World War, right? Basically, with the Wilsonian Internationalist Project, you know, um, the 14 point speeds by President Wilson. So, we had a long period of these kind of specific transatlantic relations whereby the US was the dominant partner in protecting, liberating, whatever, Europe in the TAR transatlantic relationship. Here on the bottom, you'll see the, um, this is an infographic taken from the European Commission or the EU delegation in Washington DC. And it gives you a couple of numbers that I'm gonna explain to you in detail now as well. So we do have, of course, as you see here, important trade relationships. Together, the both the, together, the US and the European Union represents about 45% of global GDP trade. That is really, they're a single together, the single largest trade power in the world. But again, they're running neck by neck. With regards to FDI or foreign direct investment, which is next to trade, probably the second most important indicator of economic significance. With regards to FDI, there's about 4 trillion, it tells you here on the bottom of the slide, um, 4 trillion collective EU US stocks. So 4 trillion mutual FDI, trillion with a T. That's really momentous. Um, with regards to trade, bilateral trade, it's a little bit more complicated because of course bilateral trade usually results in trade surpluses and trade deficits, right? No country wants to have trade deficits. So, but here, interestingly, I looked at the numbers um, for today and it also looks at there's about a trade volume of about 500 billion euros per year, 500 billion euros. And if you look down and trade in goods versus trade and services, you see that trade in goods, the EU carries a trade surplus, but then with goods and services or exchange in services, the US carries a slight trade services surplus. So it kind of balances out with the, with the trade relations. And of course, that's also important, 15, about 15 million jobs depend on transatlantic trade relationships, right, on both sides. That is a significant number. So in, there are certainly important trade relationships and that alone um, builds a fairly substantial base for transatlantic relationships that will endure. However, as we know, there are other issues as well. Well, now we're going to talk about the personalities or the institutional lineup, right? Um, we have the longer term process of transatlantic coordination is called transatlantic dialogues. And so with regards to transatlantic dialogue, we saw already, unlike the Trump administration, which belittled the European Union, right, which downgraded the European Union, the Biden administration certainly tries again to make up for what happened over the past four years of Trump administration. So, for example, in June, um, sec uh, US President Biden joined the European Council, uh, the leaders of Europe in the council meeting in June. That was, by the way, the first time since 2014 when President Obama joined them, okay? So that shows you already the willingness of President Biden to kind of um, make sure he stays in touch and he takes note of the Europeans' demands and, and, and policy visions. 
with regards to the various legislatures, there is some contact <clears throat> between the European Parliament and uh, EU institution generals and the, the capital or the Hill, as it's called here in Washington, D.C., meaning the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, for example, even the there's a transatlantic working group that, um, for example, we just hosted last whatever a year ago um, in in Miami. Um, and there's also in Washington, D.C., the European Parliament has a liaison office to kind of to directly build bridges with the U.S. legislature. Then you have, of course, general diplomatic relationships. The EU has an embassy, the EU delegation in Washington, D.C. And by the way, it's kind of notable that the Washington EU delegation is the oldest uh, delegation outside of Europe that was founded already as far back as 1954. So that tells you something about some of the historical fundamentals. And you have the experts, and by experts yes, you see you also have, sorry, you have you have also the delegation in New York, right? Yes, absolutely, right. I totally forget to mention that. You're right. You have, of course, also thank you the delegation in New York. We shouldn't forget that. Yeah, I was just sort of because of the bilateral focus. I was not looking at the at, at that. I wasn't thinking of that. Um, with regards to experts. You see now um, there's more dynamism under the Biden administration. We just had a high level working group on trade and technology in Pittsburgh um, that these are experts working in trade and technology sectors and they came from the European Commission, right? And um, the European Council moved over to visit with high level um, uh, Biden administration officials. So there's the Trade and Technology Council that was just inaugurated. And with regards to climate change, there's also now a high level climate change council. We'll see um, there are some problems probably for both, which I'll maybe talk about in a minute. However, some of the more political issues, which are also backbones of that relationship, are of course the question, are they global leadership partners? They pronounce that they are global leadership partners. It's all this talk about the West, yada, yada, yada. Um, but there are two major points of concern. And under the Biden administration, they're the first one about how to design international security and the future of NATO. That is still an unresolved issue, as most of you know. The question about to what extent the US should agree to a multilateral and a multipolar international system is another one. But we've seen that the, uh, the uh, Biden administration has become, of course, right, much more multilateral in that sense already than the Trump administration or any uh, in the line with President Obama's um, affairs. For example, both the European Union and the Biden administration agreed that, for example, in the wake of the pandemic, the W. HO, the World Health Organization, ought to be reformed, and they both also put proposals forward to for a reform of the World Trade Organization, right? Potentially working even on issues such as global trade inequality. But the big sticking point, as you can imagine, is still NATO. It's not only that long-held, you know, Trump argument about the Europeans are not are undermining NATO, they're not only putting up enough money for NATO, right? That's a more practical, pragmatic argument. But if somebody like President Macron for just two or three years ago has argued that NATO is brain dead, whereas the Biden administration still relies on NATO um, and NATO itself um, seems to be, I mean, if you followed it, which I've done periodically, right? You know that after the Cold War, basically my argument is NATO has been in a crisis for the past 30 years, right? There's, Every couple of years, it's like, yeah, NATO is that. Long live the new NATO. Question is, you know, what is NATO used for? And some see it now that with the Biden administration's increased focus on China, that um, there's some pressure for NATO to switch its enemy focus, enemy target from Russia to China. And I'm certain that many European countries would not want to go ahead with that kind of reassessment, okay? So NATO is still the, the, and of course that's related to the European Union's strategic autonomy concept, which you probably are familiar with, right? We have to see if this bears actually fruit outside of PESCO or other um, EU military 
uh, smaller initiatives. Well, then we always highlight again the West. We are the West. We're both liberal democracies, right? But as you know, the question is in the age of polarization, misinformation and domestic popularism, which we both experienced, but which obviously was very came first, I would say, in the United States, was more heavily pronounced in the United States. And we don't know what's happening. Everyone, I'm already afraid for 2024, the next US elections. And we can talk about this towards the end. OK. But so the question of like, you know, that the West has, I think, the West, Europe and the United States has lost its guarantee to talk to them as guarantors of global democracy, because global democracy in itself or democracy has been a misused, abused term. The same can be said about human rights promotion, because often it's aligned to democracy. So um, the, we can talk about this maybe more later, but I also make that book in my that point in my in my book that the way human rights are oftentimes advanced and imposed by both the US and the United States invalidates some of their commonalities. And then the question of inequality um, or equality that can be you know intersectional equality issues, right? Based on race, based on you know migration status, based on gender. Um, but also here, of course, I'm thinking importantly about global socioeconomic inequality. And here, um, there's it's obvious should be obviously clear that while we both Europe and the United States face intense pressure from, for example, China, from Vietnam, from the BRIC countries, for you know because of our high wage, high price. Um, e economies, right? The, I think the Europeans are not quite as willing to go down the race to the bottom as the US is because for the US, and you see this in many cases, still the bottom line, the financial bottom line, neoliberalism um, reigns supreme. Now, um, a little bit about the US's view of the EU, and I mentioned this in the article, of course, that varies. It's there's not one uniform view that the Biden administration views the EU as such, okay? But of course, it varies by the role that these people inhabit. So, for example, we see, and I've mentioned this in the article that I sent you, um, we see a distinct difference between political elites and um, the masses, the public, the general public, in how they evaluate the role of the European Union. Um, you also, of course, see a distinction in terms of education. The more educated Americans will have a higher approval generally of the European Union because they know what the European Union serves. Whereas as late as of 2004, 77% of Americans did not know what the European Union was. I would say that has improved. So more Americans now know what the European Union is, but according to the latest, Bertelmann's Foundation Transatlantic Trends Survey by the Bertelmann's Foundation. Still, the US is the country among all Western, whatever, you know, global uh, developed uh, economies, the country with the highest knowledge deficit with regards to the European Union. And increasingly in this age of polarization, it depends on people's individual left or right positioning. Right. So, um, for example, Democrats or Democrat leaning people, um, they have a much higher, more positive evaluation of the European Union as opposed to Democrats. And here I'll switch to the next slide and I want you to take a look just here at the, the graph on the not the green graph on the right, but the left hand graph. OK, you can see it. This is taken from the Pew Research Center. They always have good um, research coming out and survey polls. In the US, they state and this is from 2019, that survey, the partisan gap in the, US, in the US on the European Union is the widest in more than 15 years. So the blue line means that that's the opinion of Democrats or democratic leaning leftist progressives in the US. 65% view the EU as positive, whereas only 40% right, of Republicans or rightist view the EU as positive. That's a 25% difference. That then works out to, if you look to the right, and I circled here just Italy, 
right, for you, but also the US. So there's in an average of 62% right now as of 2021, however, right? The other surveys from 2019 that was during the Trump administration. Now we have a joint approval rating of 62. So you can see here, there has been a more positive trend in um, evaluating the European Union from the US view. I'm sorry, here. Lastly, however, together with the knowledge deficit that the Americans have with regards to what the European Union stands for, what it is, here on top, if you look to the top left, this is a time series um, evaluation um, where the upper graph shows you the number of Americans overall who have a favorable opinion on the European Union. And except with that dip in the year 2003, 2004, that was during the Iraq war, right, where the Americans literally wanted to, you know, the, the right wing wanted to rename French fries into freedom fries, right, and poured French wine into the streets and all this, this little fun stuff. Um, aside from this little gap, it has been fairly constant. There have been only gaps, you know, up upwards of 10% up and down. That also shows you maybe some stability, but it shows you a, um, a indifference towards the EU as a increasingly important political partner. Now, what are some of the factors for the divergence? I'm just checking you the time here. Yeah, for the divergence of transatlantic relations, that the, that the transatlantic rift has gotten wider. Well, here on the bottom, you just quickly see, I took this also from the Pew Research Center. You see here the changing European view on American administrations. And it shouldn't surprise you that, of course, Republican administrations are usually not as welcome because they are even more unilateralists, right? And then you see here under the Obama period, the two terms under President Obama, Europeans loved Obama superstar, right? And then back to a fairly low evaluation. There's no Italy graph here, but you see here Germany, France, and Spain, and the UK mentioned, okay? And of course, now that has, so there has been a, trust advance of the Europeans with the Biden administration be precisely because they know that the Biden administration in many ways will continue um, some of the most of the Obama administration's policy. Okay, but continuing most of the Obama administration policy policies also means that, of course, the Biden administration will continue the so called Asia pivot or pivot to Asia, right? The meaning the, the shift that started under the Obama administration to pull attention away from Europe, to pull troops away from US troops away from European countries, and to move it to the new center of attention, global attention, which is Asia. You see this, right? With the tensions in the Southeast China Sea, you see this with um, Hong Kong, you see this with Taiwan. This is where sort of the future geopolitical tensions are largely located, according to the US. And with that geopolitical pivot to Asia that the US has initiated, um, there is a fear of that the EU is becoming less important for their partner. And there's also the fear of the so-called G2, meaning that in the future, there will be only two superpowers so basically back to the Cold War, good old Cold War times, right? It will be only between the US and China without, and Russia and, and Europe will become again a pawn, right? In the middle um, that can be sort of a proxy, you know, that can be influenced, meddled with, and so on and so on. Um, another um, point in this, uh, di for this divergence is the second point that I'm making here, that there is a more generalized, the US has a more generalized country threat perception, whereas the EU increasingly has an issue threat perception. And by that, I mean that if you think of, okay, what are some of the most threatening uh, partners or issues or counterparts for the US? Well, it's Cuba, it's North Korea, right? It's Iran, and it's kind of Russia. And increasingly under Biden, it's China. However, for the EU, the EU, for example, sees increasingly, the EU institutions, see increasingly um, issues, climate change as a big issue, right? Terrorism as a big issue, you know, and less specific countries. And so we see here, and as you know, threat perceptions also determine, of course, your own approach to security policy. 
Um, another one that I make uh, the point in the writing is the there's a competitive leadership approach. And here I juxtapose the US's, and I say here net, that, well, that means the US's national religious exceptionalism. You may have heard, in particular, if you are American, you have lived in, in the US, you have uh, read about the US, the US sees itself as exceptional, as the political Jerusalem on the hill, right? That is supposed to lead the world, you know, towards democracy and yada, yada, yada. That is a form of national religious exceptionalism that the US has pronounced no matter which administration we talk about. Now, my point is, and that's others have said this as well before me, is that the European Union has also a certain type of exceptionalism, but it's not nationalistic, patriotic, or religious. In the European Union, it's secular, non-religious, but it's also Pacific. So the EU as a Pacific power, the EU as a normative power, right, has this approach to, again, be an important global actor in the world. And here you can see that there is a competition on different um, bases going on about global leadership in the world. Another point is about norms and different norms. Despite um, us pronouncing similar norms as Western liberal democracies and so on and so on, there, the difference that the US is more neoliberal and the EU is still more proud of their welfare states. For example, in the US, we still don't have nationally mandated holidays or vacation days, right? I mean, that's that's almost hard to, to believe for many most Europeans. Um, companies, pri the private sector just gives people vacations because of course they want to attract the best employees, right? But there is still no nationally mandated vacation. So President Biden, in his infrastructure and big reform package that is right now heavily debated in US Congress, he wants to put in more social welfare regulations that would make it easier, you know, to take maternity or paternity leave, right? It would maybe institute vacation, but that hasn't hasn't happened. And in a polarized domestic politics that the US has, we'll see how much is left of the Biden agenda. Sovereignty, of course, is a big issue, as you know. Um, the Europeans have agreed to give up some of the sovereignty, but by and large, for the US political culture, it is still unthinkable that the Europeans would um, give up sovereignty um, towards the European Court of Justice, for example, right? Because the, Europe the Americans, you know, for them, the, the Supreme Court is usually sacrosanct. And again, other issues such as weaponry, the use of weapons, the weapons industry. By here, it's everything from the US's military industrial sector, right? Having the largest, together with Russia, armaments industry in the world, to the individual use of weapons. And you heard here, I mean, I've become so numb of school shootings, unfortunately, right? Or mall shootings. But that's a fact of life here in the US. I think that's still not accepted, luckily, in Europe. And of course, something that links both of them together, but in a really odd way, is the rise of populism. And I think part of why the EU still has a fairly firm standing is because many countries and many European publics have seen how bad it can get in the US with the type of Trump populism and polarization that we, by the way, still suffer. Uh, again, I'm still wor not worried about the US's long-term democratic stability. But then again, if you look at what's happening right now in Europe, um, right? You've seen the contestation by populists. Marine Le Pen just went to to Budapest, right, to visit with Orban. And you know, Orban is able to get support from the U.S. far right and from President Putin. I mean, you know, there's a lot we can maybe touch upon this later, talk in more detail. But you know, there is a convergence that both Europe is becoming more populist and. The U.S. is just keeping sort of the lid on the populist fervor or disruption. And of course, there's always a question in Transatlantic because it's about dialogue. What kind of institutionalization is possible? In the past, there was the attempt in the early 2000s to come up with TTIP. TTIP stands, in case you haven't heard about it, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which would have created the largest free trade zone in the world between the US and the European Union. 
Um, that was in the works for years. The Obama administration tried to get it passed. Unfortunately, didn't get it passed in 2016. Trump administration came in power early 2017. The Trump administration put it on ice or declared it dead, right? Because of the isolationist tendencies of the Trump administration. Um, we have not heard the Biden administration make, I think the Biden administration just came in literally and has more important issues. Plus the tariffs are so low between both that, you know, I think they say this is for later, but we have to watch it. A bigger issue are the tech giants. And that is of course, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, right? They are, if you look at them, they all happen to be American tech giants, right? However, um, the, there's two issues, the question of regulation. And we see now that both European uh, regulators, including commissioner of um, the Danish commissioner um, for economy, right? As well as the, can't remember her name right now, um, as well as the US regulators want to regulate, want to uh, put legal limits on the tech giants. But, so there's some convergence, but where there will be divergence is taxation of their activities, right? Because there's, you know, they still use a lot of the tax loopholes and the Europeans want to start taxing these tech giants more. And there has been literally already pushback from the US um, saying like, why are you basically zoning into only American tech companies? Well, because they just happened, right? The largest are American. So there I see increased tensions that are not easily avoidable. Climate, we will see what happens. I think the COP26 meeting in Glasgow next week will be the first indication to what extent there will be a convergence on both sides regarding climate change, addressing climate change. NATO, uh, honestly, I mean, it, it, it is becoming problematic. NATO in many ways will remain a problematic. The current secretary of um, state, um, in the US said, yeah, he's open to the US, uh, to the Europeans developing more autonomy, but that autonomy still needs to be complementary to US existing NATO structures. So only as long as we, EU building EU forces are complementary to NATO, right? Um, that combined with stuff like what just recently happened, you heard about this probably, that um, the Putin administration just closed down the NATO delegation in Moscow, right? That certainly will have sort of a NATO US Russia impact and will detract a little bit because now the Biden administration may not be able, they still have to work more on the Russia relation and cannot zoom in on attacking China so much. And of course, the International Court of Justice, ICJ, is less of an issue. That's a respected UN court. The International Criminal Court, there are still some residual problems that US administrations of every couleur have with the criminal court, given that it was recently set up and given that they're afraid that the criminal court could come after US soldiers and their atrocities in various wars and conflicts. In general, what distinguishes here the Europeans and the US is that the EU is more process oriented, meaning they put more effort into meetings, into the process, they don't need to see the results. Whereas the US, of course, being one single country, often acts quicker, often acts unilateral and prefers to see action uh, rather than the long-term process that the Europeans um, have become accustomed to. Finally, to leave off, because I think your time is more or less running away, I believe that there will be more of a competitive cooperation in a more geopolitical world. And by that, there's a big question that I mentioned earlier. Is Trump, that's the open question. And either way, I live in Miami, I live in Florida. Um, you can ask me a question about this. Our governor is Ron DeSantis. If Donald Trump doesn't run, Ron DeSantis would be Trump light. He would be the most favorable candidate. So watch what happens in 2024. Um, but so the, then the question is, is Trump just a four year mistake or particularly if should he be reelected if he's still alive in four years? That would certainly cause a really structural divergence between the Europeans and the US.
a more long term issue, no matter if it's Republicans in power or Democrats in power is, of course, that question of how will the US administrations approach international policy making? Right? The EU is seen as an ambiguous, maybe also not reliable ally, because the EU favors global, peaceful, pacific multilateralism. And that's not necessarily in line with the US Western style military preferred US led global leadership that they want to remain on top of everyone else. Then there are a whole other host of issues that I just quickly want to mention. A, the impact of polarization. Like I said, we have polarization on both continents, but they have different impacts. Misinformation campaigns, as you know, that could be everything from social media misinformation that the publics are exposed to. We've seen this under COVID and COVID, the isolation at home has led to many people just go haywire uh, in their consumption of fake news at home all the way to state misinformation, right? By state actors such as Russia or Iran or China. The EU's own political configuration is in question. What happens with post Merkel Germany, right? Uh, under Merkel, you know, Germany was the leader of the EU. Um, you know that we have now coalition talks. It will likely be more amenable, likely, if that coalition, the, the traffic light coalition between the Social Democrats, the Greens and the Liberals in Germany wins out because they would be more politically aligned with Biden's democratic leanings. But then, you know, um, France has elections in April next year. So Macron has an uphill battle for himself, right? And so the question of a the what will be the leadership of the EU in the medium term is open. And of course, that will influence transatlantic relations as well. And the impact of what I despairingly call here the rest, meaning what about the other countries? What about the BRIC countries? How will China's rise turn out, right? How will Putin's, how much will Putin longer be in power or, um, you know, will be able to exert power on the Europeans through issues such as the gas pipelines and the gas supply that has become such an issue now this winter. And finally, I'll make the point if the EU wants to be viewed as an equal partner, which they make the announcement, the EU, of course, also needs to solve its many internal crises. And you, I don't have to tell you about the various crises that we had, right? From the Euro crisis to the migration waves, to Brexit, to the pandemic, to I don't know what, right? What else? I forgot probably one or two of the others. Okay, I leave it at here and I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so, yes. Okay, so thank you very much, Marcus. And now the floor is open the, to your questions, uh, comments, uh, and so on. So you can take uh, your the, the mic of your devices in order to <clears throat> put the question or use the chat as you wish. Okay. You can ask me any, almost anything. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's wait a bit. Sure, don't worry. Yes, there is one there. Okay. Uh, from Nicholas. Um, Nicholas, do you uh, would you like to take the mic and you read the, your 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 question, or do you want me to read it or what else? I can read it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, if, if we take social constructivist arguments seriously, language influences thoughts. And the US, the US, you are not entitled anymore to talk about democracy. Who should do? Would that erode worldwide democracy even more? Uh, where are you from, uh, Nicholas? From Germany. Okay. Thank okay, you. perfect. Very good. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Please, yeah, please. please. We'll take them one by one, right? Yeah, one by one. Was there anything else? Okay. So, Niklas, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, that's a good question. To, to be very honest, um, I do have a 
fairly, again, I'm a const critical constructivist, right? As I would call myself, um, as a political sociologist of the European Union, as a critical constructivist, and that tells you already also probably already what my point viewpoint on democracy is, right? A democracy is likely to be one of the most abused terms that we have. It's also one, just analytically speaking, of the most conceptually stretched terms. I mean, if, if President Putin can talk about democracy, if China can talk about democracy, if Iran can talk about basic democratic steps, right? Then, um, you know, I'm not all that worried about who should talk about democracy? I actually do think we should be much more careful of using democracy if we don't really mean it. And to be very honest, I'm not sure that uh, many analysts say, okay, democracy, the US um, was a big proponent and the Europeans after World War II, right? During the Cold War were big proponents. But if you look at the way, even during the Cold War, um, how the US has intervened in Panama, in Grenada, right? In the Vietnam War, uh, the way in which democracy has been, you know, implemented badly through conflict in many ways. I, I'd rather personally would step back and, and would rather say, okay, we, we should all be very careful to be talking about democracy, right? I perceive as democracy, and many others would do that too, as uh, according to Max Weber, right, as a Weberian ideal type, in the sense that democracy is not really not ever achieved. It is something that, you know, we should strive forward to improving our quality of democratic governance. But unfortunately, it is A, um, um, oppressively advanced to aggressively around the world by powerful nations and B, it is used in a way that invalidates, you know, the, the, the notion of democracy and C, by the way, um, this may be a little bit more radical even, but if you look at it, um, there are many other countries who say like, you know, including China, who says like, you know what, I mean, we have basic village level democracy, but it's more important for us to have economic equality, right? Because economic equality is a better guarantee for civ civil rights than uh, the freedom of assembly or freedom of speech. So, you know, I'm just making you here aware that we also need to be aware of our own Western centric, Eurocentric view of democracy and that there are many other opinions out there that you see this in UN politics that may not agree with democracy being the, the solution for, for the globe. Not that I'm saying I'm not, I don't, I personally, of course, I am for democracy. And I think it is worrisome that now after, if you look at the VDEM, which is the VDEM indicator, right, for global democracy, they attested that now in 2021, for the first time in 20 years, there are more autocracies than democracies across the globe. Yes, that is a, that is an issue for me as well. But I also want to, to answer your question, I want to, we, we have to be way more careful when we use the term democracy. And I think use it in a much more limited and careful sense. Okay, thank you. So there is another question from Vasily from Moscow, I guess. Sure. So Vasily, please, uh, can you take your mic? Sure. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, th so uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for your presentation. It was very informative and thought provoking. Well, as far as uh, my questions go, I would first ask you, could you expand a bit on the EU-US uh, cooperation in the Arctic today? Is it high on the agenda? Mm -hmm. And the second mm -hmm. question is about uh, the recent development uh, in the security domain, mm -hmm. uh, the AUKUS deal. So does this deal imply that um, in security terms, the US no longer relies on its European allies? and uh, try to co tries to cooperate more with uh, Australia, the United Kingdom, in terms of uh, its geopolitical rivalry with China. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Vasily. Good questions. Thank you, Vasily, and thank you for, for switching on your camera also. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. It's nice to see people, right? I mean, that's part of why we want to get away from it rather than just speaking to to black screens. Okay, thanks. Um, good questions. So for the first one, you know about the, the Arctic. Honestly, I don't want to pretend that I know too much about it, but I have a colleague here in my department who is, is uh, sort of working on, on the Arctic, uh, Lucas Denner. And, you know, it appears to me, 
but that's more, you know, sort of a informed guess than really substantial knowledge, right? That um, there is not much going on in EU US cooperation over the Arctic. I could be wrong in that, right? I haven't seen or heard much about it because it seems that it's really a little bit of a A. It's, you know, the scramble for the Arctic, just like the scramble for Africa previously was there, right? So there now this new scramble for the Arctic where every country from Russia, the Europeans recently came out saying, I think for the first time, that there needs to be some international legal treaty measurement for the Arctic that goes beyond existing international law. And then you see Canada also, right? Um, putting their, literally their stake into the game. And of course, the US, remember there was this whole, I mean, joke, I would say about um, Trump wanting to buy Greenland. I'm not sure, you know, to what extent that is impactful, but that, that so this is one thing that there is this, this uh, scramble for the Arctic that seems to be, every nation seems to be on its own, including the US, but I'm not sure that the, we'll, we'll see, let's, let's see, the next four years will show us if the US, the Biden administration agrees that to the European stance that there should be more regulation about the future use of the Arctic, if that makes sense, right? So I think that will show you, you know, to what extent there is an EU US cooperation over the Arctic possible. Now with the second one, that is really interesting, exactly. The AUKUS deal, right? So AUKUS, AUKUS, whatever, stands for uh, Australia, the first two, AU, and then you have UK, and then you have US, ACUS, right? In the Australia, US, UK, US deal, in which, remember, just for the ones who are not familiar with it very quickly, in which the French government had uh, the issue that their contract or their agreement for for the US and Austra for Australia to supply nuclear power, not nuclear weapon, nuclear powered submarines was canceled. Um, and the US was putting the UK as a, as a supplying partner for these nuclear powered submarines for Australia. In now, of course, you all probably have heard that the French government was very, Macron, you know, was not happy about that decision, particularly since that meant um, not only for the French losing whatever 40 billion euros or whatever it was, but it also meant that the Biden administration, which initially um, didn't didn't want to have too close relations with uh, Johnson in Britain, actually prioritized the relationship with Britain, the Brexited partner, over France. Right. So um, there was some fallout. The, however, you know, I'm not sure the fallout in transatlantic relations will be all that big because, uh, for example, Macron wanted to prevent even the latest meeting of the Tech and uh, Trade and Technology Council in Pittsburgh. However, he was unable to push that through because, you know, there's not only France, there are 26 other countries in the EU, right, who may want to have more closer relationships who were not as much impacted by the US's AUKUS deal. Now, directly to your question, does the deal imply that in security terms, the US will rely more on non-European countries in the geopolitical rivalry with China? Okay, here, of course, first of all, I see now Britain as non-European, right? In the sense it's non-EU, right? I think that's what you may have meant. Um, but then, of course, will the US rely more on other non-European countries? I'm not sure if there are other significant actors, you know, but China for sure, again, as I mentioned earlier, China will become a point of contention because you have seen that um, the Europeans and the European Union, while they had also a tense relationship with China, they needed China as a major trading partner as well, right? And the Biden administration is much more aggressive towards China than the European want, European want to be. In part, a lot also had to deal, to be very honest, if you look at it, at Merkel's leadership, right, and her dominance. I mean, she was regularly in, in Beijing, right, because she also wanted to make sure that German industry was, you know, favorably treated at the expense of some human rights affairs and others, okay? And of course, it was partly also, you know, Germans, uh, Merkel's general disposition 
um, to talk to to partners, even though even if the partners do not really, you know, want what the Europeans want, right? So Merkel, she has more of an engagement, whereas the US again is less uh, willing to engage China and is much more confrontational with regards to China. So in that sense, I think the next four years will also um, show a divergence because the Europeans, again, they don't want to become the pawn, right? Or the little helper of the US's outsized aggression towards China. Notwithstanding the fact, by the way, no, 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 notwithstanding the fact that if you look at not only have the Europeans quite intricate relations with China, economic relations, right? If you look at the US China relations, I mean, you probably are aware of this, right? Aside from the heavy um, trade dependency, manufactured goods in particular, right? China, of course, is also the, look at the US national debt. The large majority of US national debt is owned by China, right? So, I'm curious to see how Biden can square the circle, being more aggressive on China, if he knows that China is kind of financing US national debt. Right, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you, Vasily. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, any other question on the chat or, or live here? Yes, there is one. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, from Fabio. Fabio, would you like to take the mic or do you want me to read it? Oh, there's another one. Okay, okay. Just a second. Okay. Okay, you should be able to hear me. Okay, let's go. Go, go. Okay, first of all, thank you, Professor, for your uh, lesson. And I wanted to ask you, considering the, the contradiction between the idea of uh, like NATO and especially American primacy for mm -hmm. European defense, like um, the idea that Europeans, uh, you know, every time Europeans try to do something on the fence, they get kind of shot down by the Americans because NATO is uh, the primary um, framework for that. And the fact that the US wants to pivot to China and uh, the question is the US, can, can the US really focus on both fronts if it needs to be? Uh, so given that this uh, contradiction is kind of unsustainable, I think. What could be like a meeting point between uh, the US shift uh, to Asia and the idea of uh, NATO primacy and the idea of the EU to um, develop a defense, a EU defense? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. That's a good question. Thank you, Fabio. Um, okay, there are a couple of many questions in there, right? So I'm just gonna um, give a couple of these points here. So, you know, part of what I think in relation to what is my perspective on the future of EU strategic auto autonomy in defense policy, right, as well as NATO, I think both are still up for grabs. And like I said, you know what, I mean, I've been watching NATO for since the 90s. And in my opinion, NATO has been in a identity crisis for the past 30 years. Okay. And so, NATO needs to, the NATO nations really need to kind of figure out a more long term sustained plan. If now there's a, a suggestion that NATO should use, suddenly switch their enemy target towards China rather than Russia, that would not go down well in European capitals, right? Europeans would not play that game. At the same time, what we see now is that, of course, based on Putin's, I mean, it seems almost like Putin wants to, just like North Korea, right? North Korea is shooting a rocket every time they feel like they're not being hurt. Now it seems like Putin is, you know, closing down NATO offices in Moscow because he feels like, oh, there's not enough attention put on, on Russia, right? And China gets all the attention. So, and we see now that NATO has, uh, office has been closed by Russia. Um, that's a bi increasing bilateral spat. We've seen that um, Sweden and Finland are now thinking of joining NATO. So you can see here also that uh, NATO in itself may be changing in the future. But really with regards to the Middle East here, I think what is important is, yes, we again, Afghanistan has shown that the, the abrupt withdrawal from Afghanistan, where Europeans didn't have enough time to prepare for the withdrawal of their own people and Afghanis, has shown that um, the US will always put their own 
national interest first. Okay, and if that means, and that's pretty much what Biden has said, he, he said he wants to conclude that 20 year old unsuccessful war. And that's what he did. And he did it right after, remember, he assumed presidency because he knew that if things kind of work out in Afghanistan, he can paper over the um, dissatisfaction of the Europeans and of NATO partners. Okay, if he does it right now at the beginning of his presidency, he can show by giving more money to Pakistan to host Afghanistan, by putting more, you know, more money into Afghanistan in the long run, right? But he can paper over the dissatisfaction. But he was very clear, and I listened to his, his speech to the US Congress and to US people. Um, very interesting if you read it. It was very clear that US national interest for him will always come first over basically global multilateral interests, right? And it's time that the Europeans realize that as well. If they haven't already. Now, the other point, that critical point, with regards to common solution for the future for the Middle East, is of course the Iran nuclear deal, right? And um, the Iran nuclear deal. Remember, the Europeans, Mogherini, she put a lot of effort into getting that that going, right? The Europeans were really the leading partners in the Iran nuclear deal. The Trump administration basically withdraw from it. The Biden administration is now getting back to it. I think these couple of next weeks will be critical in the US and the US is willing to sign up to the nuclear deal that was just sort of after Biden took the presidency in January. The Iranians didn't want to do something for a couple months because the Iranians had domestic elections. So they wanted to wait till their own president is in now, but it's now he's now in office. So the next couple of weeks or months we will see, and I think that's my, my informed guess more than anything else, is that the Biden administration will work towards re-establishing the Iraq nuclear Iran nuclear deal and that will show the Europeans and basically that the with regards to the Middle East the US is trying to make good maybe for Afghanistan and for the Trump administration more generally right so I do think there will be more of a convergence with regards to the Middle East um, precisely because it is seen that you know between Syria Libya Iran Afghanistan um, that, that really demands more than just a Western, it demands a Western response, if I want to use the term, right? But it really demands a global response, a UN based response. I hope okay, there is, yes, okay. So thank you, Fabio. There is another question from Daniele. Daniele, where are you at Omo or are you here? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, right. let's go. Uh, so my question was uh, partially answered by by the t by um, by Marcos. So it was about uh, Afghanistan also. Um, mm. But what do you think is going to be the role of the EU and US in managing the Afghanistan crisis? Holding different perspectives in handling the recent Afghanistan backlash might distance the EU from the US, or it would mm. lead both actors in search of more constructive approaches and solutions towards the Middle East region. So I think we, yeah, Marcus all answered this question, but do you think uh, the situation might change uh, in in the next decade? No, to be honest, no. I think, like I said, I think there's optimistic signs for a convergence despite the general hiccup. But if the Europeans really, you know, let's say, um, Again, it's really unlikely, but if somehow the Europeans were able to build up an independent security force with more really true strategic abilities and strategic autonomy, that would lead to more tensions with the US. However, I do not think that the Europeans will be able to do that because they haven't been able to do that in the tw last 20 years either. Um, sorry to be so sarcastic. Um, and the bigger point, Daniele, I think is really there will be more divergence over China, right? And again, remember, China is related to NATO, as I just said, right? So if NATO switches sort of its attention from Russia away, the Cold War attention, toward building a new Cold War with China, then I think the Europeans will um, pr protest that because they do not see eye to eye over China, right? They don't want to, they don't see that they have really a stake in the South China Sea, except France, obviously. Okay, so okay, so let's see whether there are any other questions or not from from 
somewhere. Yeah. So, but how does the um, United States uh, see the UK after Brexit? This is a yeah. very interesting topic, you know. No, no, that, that, that is, is true. Yeah, yeah, yes, please, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah. 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 Exactly. No, because so, it, it, it is interesting because the, should they uh, that is are they, do they consider uh, the UK a global player as they consider themselves uh, or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, that's right. As you know, there is this sort of underlying cultural affinity, of course, right? It's not. It's it's more than a love hate relationship. It's more a love relationship, despite sort of the Tea Party in Boston and so on, and that the you know the British uh, pilgrims came right to the U.S. So there is an underlying cultural affinity for many reasons. And during out the Cold War, we've seen this cultural affinity, and I think you see this even now in the UN with the P5, the permanent five members, right? Whereas the U.S. and the U.K. vote more aligned than the US and France, for example, as one of the European P5s. Now, with, since Brexit, that has, of course, changed a little bit. And remember, initially, Biden said that if Brexit occurs and the Brits want to have a relationship with the US, the British will have to go back to the end of the line, of the negotiation line. Right, so they are not prior preferential partners anymore, but they will have to go to the back of the line for negotiations. Now, I'm I think Biden must have changed his mind because AUKUS has showed us that he's definitely willing to make deals with the British, and the British are still hopeful that they can carve out a um, U.S. U.K. trade deal by the end of Biden's term, which is in 2024. We shall see if that happens. But there is this race, this competitive race, of course, now between the Europeans and between the UK to 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 get a bilateral trade deal going. So that's watch what watch what happens in that sense. Um, but in general, under the Biden administration, definitely the um, relations have become cooler and they have become more pragmatic, more transactional, for a number of reasons. Two, I mentioned here just two. One is political affinity. I mean, Boris Johnson, right, is sort of a semi-populist conservative. Biden is the exact opposition, opposite of it. Okay, so there's some, you know, political ideology that doesn't quite click there. And the second reason is Brexit related. Remember, Biden has Irish heritage, right? And is sort of very proud of his Irish heritage. You may be familiar now that one of the biggest issues that's now existing in EU Brexit relations is over the Irish border, right? Over the, the, the European control over the Irish border and the goods. So Biden has already threatened the Brits and said like, if you're messing with Irish sovereignty or indirect EU control over Ireland through your Northern Irish protocol, Britain, you will be sorry. And so these are just two of the, the factors why there is a much more cooler relationship, right? But it's quite interesting. I think now we have this competitive triangle in a way going. And again, I mean, I don't rule out that Trump wins in 2024, God forbid. But um, if that happens, right, then uh, we have a whole different ballgame, as you can imagine.